just want to touch on that. So good evening. Uh, it's the Thursday, April 19th, 2018 uh, meeting of the Ann Arbor Area Transportation Authority Board of Directors. We uh, don't have a quorum this evening, but we have four members present, and we will have a good working discussion about some of the otherwise agenda items. So because we don't have a quorum, we have no need to approve our agenda, and we'll just wing it from here. Uh, but we'll generally follow the format. Um, one, I guess, uh, item to mention <coughs> uh, is the, um, from the Governance Committee, that we discussed, we had spent a lot of time uh, this last meeting talking about the millage, uh, our millage campaign, uh, other aspects of the millage. Fundraising, we discover, uh, we talked about at our last kind of fundraising meeting uh, in terms of the apparatus of it, uh, targeting potential um, uh, donors for that, our potential budget, we've solidified a treasurer, we've solidified the, uh, we've set up the ballot committee who's going to handle the funding, which is the Partners for Transit, reactivating that. Uh, we'll encourage all board members to make some personal contribution to that, as I think most did last time. We've also got the, um, uh, I, I think I mentioned a potential budget there. Uh, so we continue to work out the messaging. Um, pamphlets, leaflets, et cetera, and we'll have more for the board. Uh, we won't wait till the next board meeting, but we'll distribute more information as we get the apparatus for uh, board review and um, uh, an input as we get this going. But we are, again, working with the Ecology Center to uh, put the apparatus in place. <coughs> uh, I don't know if I missed anything, Roger or Matt, that you want to add in terms of an update for that, but uh, we will come back to board members to ask them to do their share for the fundraising effort and for the messaging effort going forward. We'll, we're kind of crafting the talking points um, and probably picking on um, target groups and individuals that we want to target for messaging and, and fundraising as we go forward. Uh, but that's, I think, the general update for that. I don't know if Matt or Roger wants to add anything. All right. Uh, finance committee, do you want to report out on anything? Eve? You want to use your mic? So um, we uh, met on uh, Tuesday, April 10th, and we saw a uh, interesting and data full presentation on the customer survey process. Um, it led to some uh, good conversation and uh, reinforcement of some of the things that we have talked about at the board level in the context of uh, the reaction of our customers to the services that they experience and uh, that generally is quite pleasurable for the customers. They're generally pleased. and. Um, Interesting in looking at the uh, survey report is the uh, one of the I important features is that the similar set of questions have been asked over time. So there's a time series uh, analysis that can be done and the question of who our riders are, how long they've been riding, uh, some newer questions related to things like Uber um, and uh, uh, ride hauling services and that is that uh, affecting your decision to ride or not to ride transit. So it, all in all, it was very interesting. Um, is the report available t through the board uh, or the website? Uh, they are all uh, eventually posted on the website. Uh, they yeah. will be there. Uh, I'm not sure of the timing, but uh, hopefully soon. Yeah, so for viewers at home or for members uh, around, uh, I would think that if you have any specific questions, uh, there were some uh, observations about the value of uh, retaining riders as opposed to recruiting riders and uh, things of that sort. But uh, it was so chock full of data that I would do a disservice if I try to characterize it 
uh, even though without a quorum I could go on and on, but I will choose not to. Um, we also uh, did um, review uh, at a very high level some of the challenges in producing an asset uh, protection policy, and uh, given the uh, importance of the issue, uh, we agreed to allow staff uh, to spend more time to further develop the document. There's a copy of some of the materials in the packet that we have today, uh, but this is going to, it's not an action item, but it's an uh, information item. We're going to be uh, looking that, at that moving forward. Um, conversation about uh, operating accounts, uh, again, without John here, it's hard to s frame, uh, but uh, the issues are we're, we're moving forward. Um, is the best way. Millage update, uh, I've already heard, we've already heard from the governance committee of recent actions, but we brought up the speed. RTA update, we were brought up the speed. Bike share update, uh, we were brought up the speed. So we had a very interesting conversation, learned a lot in the survey, discussed uh, some of the policy development, and received updates. Very productive meeting. I look forward to next month's meeting. Thank you. Mr. Hewitt, I don't know if you want to give a report out from the Service Committee. I think we received the same uh, um, survey results that uh, the Finance Committee did, and uh, I think we were quite impressed by the high satisfaction levels uh, that uh, Mr. Clark uh, stated is either certainly above the, the typical level of transit uh, authority. So he said that the, the level of customer satisfaction is. is our system is very high compared to systems around the country so that's very encouraging um, we got the same updates on uh, on status of uh, uh, various items of interest we did discuss uh, strategic vision a little bit um, the uh, suggestion there was one uh, uh, organization that put their strategic vision right above the um, ends policy so it is very clear that it, the ends policy derives from that vision and I think uh, that concept was well received um, and we committee members also had a list of several things that they thought the uh, ends committee should make sure they keep in mind as we come up with the revised ends which I've uh, forwarded to the ends committee um, and I think that's about it thanks Okay. Uh, why don't we move on to other board reports and ownership linkages. You know, Kathleen, if you have a report out for us on LAC, thank you. Good evening. Um, so we had a really healthy meeting of our LAC on uh, April 10th. We had nine executive out of ten executive members present and three general members, so I thought that was very exciting. The meeting was jam-packed. Um, we had communications and announcements. Mr. Charnetsky um, reported that the Smart Advisory Council will be using a representative from the area on aging, the area agency on aging 1B, that and also one person from that and one from each ward will be used. Also, he reported that the DDOT is completing a driver refresher training that will include disability sensitivity training, which is exciting for us to hear because as we are trying to get more access between our sister cities, it's nice to hear that they're uh, looking out for us. We had an interesting public comment. Uh, Dr. Lori Lichtman from MAP requested that the ride put labels at bus terminals and stops with information and telephone numbers with regards to human trafficking, which is becoming an increasing problem in our country. And as we all know, public transportation seems to be one of the many vehicles that they use. She was directed to speak with a staff at the ride because this was not within our purview to give her any direction or help. We had a wonderful presentation by, from KFH who reported, um, we had a dialogue via the web. They reported on their progress of the paratransit review. They're gathering feedback and they also responded to questions from LAC attendings and executive members. We announced that the board accepted the LAC appointment of Ms. Henry 
And then the FAIR study is being conducted. We had a um, presentation by four nines. Curtis and Christy were there. Um, I encourage the public, there's only one more day available, but if you're interested in taking the survey, you can find it at theride.org slash about us slash initiatives slash fair studies. They also uh, have a caveat at the bottom that while the fair study is uh, concluding tomorrow online, if you want to stay connected, you can email or uh, make a phone call and that, all that information is available on the web. Our next LAC meeting is May 8th from 10 a.m. to noon. They're held every Tuesday of every month at the Donga Bay Operations Center. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> uh, in terms of the Watts Committee, uh, Mr. Krieg is not here and I think did not attend that, but Mr. Carpenter, our CEO, I think did sit in. I don't know if he's got an update to provide. Um, thank you, only that it was a uh, successfully routine meeting. Uh, there were some uh, updates to the Regional Trans Transportation Improvement Program, which is, uh, you could think of it as the short range budget for the regional uh, federal funding uh, pipeline. Uh, there were a couple of transit oriented things in there. Really that was sort of uh, clean up uh, stemming from our 2018 budget adoption, just making sure uh, our, our projects in the TIP were the same as what the board had approved in, in the 2018 budget. Very routine. Um, uh, nothing else to report. Thank you. Uh, the A2 Transportation Commission, I know Mr. Guru Raja is not here and he also did not attend that meeting. Um, but uh, we do have an update that Mr. Guru Raja um, has abdicated his uh, position on that transportation committee and he has um, uh, asked and solicited Ms. Sims to s take his place on that commission and she has agreed to do that. We don't have a quorum here so we can't vote on that this evening but uh, I don't, did you attend the last meeting? Okay. Uh, but she'll attend future meetings uh, as our representative on that commission going forward. Uh, and I don't anticipate any pushback from that. Um, but I know Mr. Cooper, of course, goes to those meetings on a regular basis and is a pretty much runs the thing. So maybe he wants to uh, report out. Well, I would uh, just like to share a quick um, update for uh, the, the body. So at last night's meeting, uh, the city administrator walked the um, Transportation Commission through the city uh, budget process. Uh, and uh, provided update to some of the uh, details of the transportation budget itself in terms of the amount of uh, resources that are available for transportation initiatives and how those are uh, both prioritized and funding levels uh, identified. Uh, he did um, threaten the body, if you will, by in, uh, saying that the next process will be more inclusive with the commission and they should be prepared uh, to expect for him to engage with them uh, earlier and, and have more meaningful uh, dialogue related to the development of the, uh, not the budget that's coming before council uh, this year, which is the second year of a two-year budget cycle, but for uh, the next two-year uh, budget cycle. Um, there was a presentation um, on uh, the uh, Watts transportation planning process. So uh, Ryan Buck, uh, the dir director of Watts, came in and shared with the commission the uh, role that Watts plays within the transportation planning and programming process, uh, as well as um, outline uh, the 2045 planning uh, update process that his organization is currently uh, has underway. And I would encourage members of the public who are interested in the Watts Long Range Plan update to go to Watts website and or contact their staff. Um, they are trying to maintain a high level of public engagement with their planning process and I hope that I'm helping by sharing this information for our viewers at home. Um, in addition to the uh, Long Range Plan update, uh, Watts staff is serving to facilitate a dialogue uh, in the community on behalf of the Michigan DOT. So uh, many of us know that MDOT has a pavement 
uh, project in their five-year transportation plan for North Main, uh, which will be from Huron to M14 program for 2022. And the MDOT position, as it was articulated by both MDOT and uh, Ryan last night, is that their emphasis and focus and in investment will be between the curbs. Uh, but MDOT acknowledges that with the work the city's been doing under the uh, North Main Vision Task Force and other interests along North Main, that there's a significant local interest in addressing multimodal transportation, meaning walking, bicycling, uh, alongside of North Main uh, and the interaction between the North Main traffic and the border to border trail that tries to get to Huron River Drive. And so Watts uh, described its role as a facilitator of a local stakeholder group. Uh, there was a meeting earlier in April. There was general discussion about interest in um, reinforcing some of the earlier recommendations of the types of uh, non-motorized or active transportation uh, program interest for the corridor. But as MDOT's uh, design contractor will not be on board until August, uh, there was a general agreement of the stakeholders who were invited to this meeting that we will reconvene as MDOT assigns the contract to a design engineer so we would have somebody to coordinate with. Uh, the MDOT position, as uh, was described to the commission last night and at the advisory committee meeting, is that they are open to engaging with and coordinating with the city, but that the city will need to bring the resources uh, both for the planning design and construction of active transportation improvements should they want to be installed along with the 2022 pavement project. Um, beyond that, there was um, a staff update uh, made by uh, Crescent Slot and about a variety of uh, projects. Um, all that information is available on the city's website. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to respond to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's move on then. We can go to strategy and operational updates. Uh, CEO report, Mr. Carpenter. Uh, thank you. Maybe only just one thing to add. Uh, since this report was published to you, uh, we did hear back about the uh, CMAC grant project uh, process, the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Grant uh, Regional Federal Funding Pot for transportation projects. A uh, bit of a mixed result for us. Uh, our highest priority was achieved, uh, and that was receiving additional capital funding for future bus replacement purchases, a uh, very important part, particularly with uh, our 2018 budget and the need to uh, smooth out our cash flow for, for bus purchases. So that was achieved. We're quite happy with that. Uh, unfortunately, CMAC, uh, the pot ran out of money before they got to round two projects, which included our application for express bus service on US 23, uh, along with MDOT up to uh, 8 Mile. Uh, it, it basically looked, what they do is uh, every transit agency puts in their first uh, priority. They go those th for those first priorities, and if there's any money left, they'll get around to round two. Uh, I don't think they got to round two uh, at all. So uh, uh, we knew that was a risk going into it, and we weren't entirely surprised. Uh, disappointing, perhaps. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, I did have a conversation with MDOT earlier today, um, uh, and I encouraged them to continue to pursue uh, the project. And if we could be helpful, to simply all they had to do was call. Uh, and they very much appreciate that. They're going to um, uh, try to work with the university to see if there's more of a uh, employee shuttle option they might be able to do in the short term uh, from with that park and ride lot. So they're going to explore some of those options uh, a little more directly, uh, which we think is great. Uh, smaller project, lower cost, uh, lower risk of, of startup. So uh, we wish them all the best to that. and. Uh, we also we sort of rounded out the call uh, acknowledging that if it were to grow uh, it very much could be something they would have an interest in speaking with us again and I'm very happy uh, that although uh, you know the the project perhaps is not moving forward with us and to be clear it is not um, uh, we wish them all the best and I think we've built a lot of uh, good credibility and relationships with some of our partners in the area 
uh, by pursuing this project. So we look forward to their success and we will continue to monitor the progress of it. That's all I have to add. Thank you. Any questions on any of the reports from anybody? Uh, we'll move on then if you want to talk about the policy monitoring 2.8 asset protection report. Sure. So uh, uh, another policy monitoring and uh, report an opportunity uh, for the board to, uh, uh, to look at uh, accountability uh, through this lens. Um, this, this month's policy about asset protection really is about um, uh, the expectations the board has for staff in maintaining the physical uh, assets and some of the intangible assets, including reputation and credibility in the community. Um, as we've had to do with some of our earlier uh, reports uh, this first year of monitoring reports, uh, uh, regretfully, uh, I do not consider this report complete, but I think it was maybe, maybe partially complete, and I think it's a good window into the thought process of how we are approaching interpreting some of your policies. So I'm not seeking your acceptance uh, this evening. We're going to continue to work on this. Uh, and come back uh, uh, next year with a much more thorough and completed one. But I'll touch on a couple of uh, points on here that I think uh, might be interesting uh, for insight into how we are uh, uh, grappling with some of them. Uh, first, uh, uh, policy 281 on page 5, uh, it's about insurance. And you can see our interpretation and definition of that. And then on page 6, you see a nice long list of how much insurance we have and what it covers. Interesting question uh, that we raised to the finance committee. Um, you know, we hear from our broker, and we know from industry sources what, what constitutes enough coverage by industry standards, but we would not be surprised if the board wants greater assurance somehow of what en how much is enough. Um, so uh, although you can see the coverage levels uh, there, uh, perhaps there's more that can be done on that one. Uh, policy 285, I think, is also one I'm, I'm, I'm proud of. Uh, if you look on page 12, this is an intangible uh, asset. This has to do with uh, the CEO shall not endanger the organization's public image, credibility, uh, or its ability to accomplish ends. And this is a, a slippery one, actually, when you talk about credibility. And so uh, I'll draw your attention to our interpretation where what we've said, we've acknowledged that you know, some things happen that are beyond our control. And it is not appropriate to hide and never take a risk. We accepted that if we're pursuing our ends and perhaps pushing the envelope sometimes, that will likely mean uh, attracting attention and possibly criticism. And so attracting criticism is not a definition of a problem here. We, ex we acknowledge that that may happen in the pursuit of uh, in pursuit of the ends, but that we will always act in a manner that earns and renews the public's trust and confidence in the agency in spite of things that happen that are beyond our control, in spite of errors that will occur from time to time, although we do our best to make sure they don't. Inevitably, something will happen. There will be crises um, that occur that are beyond our control, and we're not going to attempt to avoid criticism by not taking risk. Uh, that's an inherent part of, of, of being proactive. So uh, this, is an act, this is interpretation, actually, I'd love to, to hear from the board uh, tonight or, or another time uh, because we think uh, it's an interesting way of approaching the board's policy, and I would be interested to know uh, if it seems reasonable. The evidence, again, how do you measure your, your public credibility? Uh, we asked the public directly, and so we're citing some uh, survey responses here. It's admittedly a proxy question. How I think the question was, do you have a favorable uh, impression of the agency itself? We're not asking them directly, do you trust us? Do you think we're credible? Do you think we're reliable? Um, those might be more direct questions, uh, but this is the evidence we have on hand. And so again, interested to know if we think that's uh, a suitable piece of evidence. Two eight, policy 2853 on page 16. Um, pertains to advertising. Uh, this is one we thought was important because uh, we have been sued in the past, or challenged, I should say, about things we do not allow on the buses from an advertising policy. 
and this happens throughout the uh, throughout the industry that sometimes provocative advertisements are rejected and people uh, perceive a freedom of speech limitation has been unduly uh, inflicted upon them so it's important to have a policy this is actually an older uh, board policy that was remanded to the CEO that uh, still exists as an administrative policy and we've now incorporated it into the interpretation uh, and then finally I would point to page 19 uh, in the back uh, as a section of CEO notes and in going through this we were not able to interpret every section of this uh, policy just for time but there were a couple of uh, policies that uh, uh, we struggled with a little bit one of them was uh, to ensure decisions were made while considering uh, social, economic, and environmental sustainability. And the other was to uh, uh, ensure we always pursued innovation. All of these we think are, are excellent uh, expectations um, and we look forward to trying to interpret them. Uh, we, sh we, we aren't quite sure how they fit in an asset management policy and per perhaps we would suggest to the board it might be worth your consideration if they uh, might be better housed in some other part of the policy manual, perhaps the ends uh, or executive uh, means limitations. Uh, that I think that's the highlights of the uh, the monitoring report, and happy to get feedback this evening or, frankly, any other any other time. Thank you. Any questions or comments about two point eight monitoring report? Kyra. I just have a quick question on the insurance on page six, the chart. Um, the only under item G here for there were five events for automobile. Do you see where I'm looking? Um, I was just wondering when I see it's as of February 21st. But since when? When is the start date for that? What's the time period? I'm afraid uh, uh, our. Chief Financial Officer John Metzinger is ill this evening, but I uh, so I don't know off the top of my head. However, I do know that this is a policy that's been in place for some time, so I believe that has probably been the case throughout the duration of the monitoring period and probably for some time. Okay. I can certainly get back to you with more specifics if you'd like. I was just hoping that wasn't calendar year 2018 five events. Um, I will say that we. Uh, there was an adjustment here. We recently adjusted items A and C for full replacement of loss of the facility and, um, and the bus fleet itself while in the facility. Previously that, uh, I think everything else in here has been roughly at the same level of coverage for, for s probably several years. Those ones we very recently uh, upgraded to ensure complete uh, complete replacement costs so if, um, if a tornado were to hit the barn the bus barn excuse me um, uh, we need to be able to immediately tap insurance money to replace the entire fleet for what new buses would cost and so uh, in the past it wasn't clear if we had full replacement value or book value of a 10 year old bus that maybe wouldn't be worth very much so we adjusted that upwards to make sure it was replacement value uh, in case of a catastrophic uh, thing. So I believe A and C have been adjusted recently, but everything else I think in here has been roughly the same for some time. Okay. Other comments, questions? Do you have any other? I will say my own input on 2.8.5. Um, I would also, I, I would agree with your interpretation about credibility. Uh, to be criticized is not to lose credibility. I think you only lose credibility. I think you hint at this here when we um, are not honest about whatever risks we take. Um, and to the extent people can criticize us, we can credibly come back with facts if we're honest about the facts to begin with. If we try to hide the ball or do other things and then we try to argue about criticisms we get, then we lose all credibility. And, and um, but I think you've, you've hinted at that here. So the transparency, the honest, uh, even when we make mistakes and we get some criticized for them, if we had an idea that we thought was good but wasn't good, uh, and that's not just the CEO, I think that goes for the board as well. We've got to, you know, to the extent we, we have a misstep, we've got to own that and, 
and just be honest about it and say we'll course correct and go forward uh, but I appreciate the data here this is uh, I, I like the bar charts that show the favorable and you know unfavorable ratings this is uh, this is quite helpful anybody else Eli so this fits under the be careful what you ask for <laughs> uh, in regard to policy 2.8.5 and 2.8.5.6 the social environmental economic sustainability and innovation clauses that you're uh, questioning as to whether they're appropriate in a section dealing with asset protection and they are no more or less uh, appropriate as the last group that uh, Eric had just talked about with regard to the image credibility those are no more or less tangible than the view of the public, our owners, uh, our customers, of how well we are stewards of the flame that we keep as a sustainable organization, one that is open to innovation. And so I would offer that as consideration that as you try to outline uh, how are these appropriate within this area, I would submit that these are uh, fundamentally important uh, elements within our uh, organizational culture and as such are an asset no more or less than uh, our public image and I think they're actually part and parcel. So uh, the other side of that coin might be uh, rather than articulating them as separate policies, if uh, staff has a uh, inability of being discreet. I think to the extent that they can become uh, incorporated into the larger issue of public image. Uh, so I, I'm not beholden to one school of thought or another, but I do believe that uh, we as a board have gone through a significant process with regard to uh, the social, economic, environmental, and have a sustainability document. Um, we don't have a similar uh, treatise on innovation, but I think you know, it's one of those things you know it when you see it. Uh, and being forward looking and um, you know, taking risks are similar to the language that you have outlined in uh, 2.8.5. So uh, I, I provide you that input as you asked for it, and I hope that helps uh, illuminate. Uh, possible direction for staff to go as you're refining this over time. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, we'll move on then to uh, maybe the board development, board education piece. And tonight we were going to get a rundown of our bus stop improvement program. And I will let Matt uh, lead that discussion. Oh, thank you very much. I'm going to invite my colleague, Mr. Jeff Murphy, uh, up. He'll be making the, uh, the, the, uh, the fun and impressive part of the presentation. I'll just give a few context words to start out with. So we haven't used the uh, board education section of the agenda very often. One of the reasons it exists is to um, scratch, scratch the board's itch on curiosity about how the operational business of the organization is conducted. And uh, we are excited to bring forward a little bit of an expose of, of how we manage uh, bus stops. Um, there had been some uh, questions uh, during the 2018 budget process about, about bus stops and, and how they were done. Uh, and so as we look forward to the 2019 budget process, we wanted to try to hit this early in the cycle to begin to, to see uh, what the board's uh, interest in this was. Um, Mr. Murphy is going to Mr. Murphy is going to present on the program that we've been using for some time, uh, and the successes and challenges that it's had to date. Um, even though this is an educational uh, item, we're very open to board feedback. Um, uh, even if there's something that's been uh, delegated specifically to staff, we're always curious to know uh, uh, how well it seems to be working from different points of view. Mr. Murphy will be referencing some existing standards, particularly utilization standards, number of uh, boardings a day, for example. Um, those are being reviewed and actually the program is being reviewed as part of uh, an ongoing service review program. So now's a great time to, to hear your thoughts 
on both the program or specific bus stops. So we welcome, we welcome it all. If we can't answer anything this evening, uh, we'll endeavor to follow it up either through the larger process uh, or uh, with a, with a follow-up to the board member in particular. Um, interestingly, the policy framework uh, that the board has, there's nothing specifically in the governance policies about bus stops per se, but there are some interesting and relevant ones uh, that I'll just mention. Uh, in your ends policies, you speak to access to destinations. People can't get on and off the buses, obviously. That's uh, not very accessible. Uh, you also speak to the accessibility uh, requirements for persons with disabilities. You do that with your ENDS statements and also under treatment of riders, which is, of course, where I think the majority of relevant board language to this program exists, uh, calling for a high level of quality, uh, high level of customer satisfaction, uh, very much as Mr. Murphy will show. Uh, this program is oriented towards that. Um, policies on financial planning and budgeting very much speak to uh, using scarce resources wisely. One of the things Mr. Murphy will mention is that the program is very much set up to benefit the largest number of people uh, given limited resources. So that's a, a context he will mention. And also there's a, a great uh, example of collaboration here, which is mentioned as a requirement or an expectation from the board in, in policy 210. Uh, about uh, looking for collaboration opportunities and our, uh, our, our uh, bus stop collaboration program. I think it's a great example of that. So in closing, uh, we're happy to present this information as the educational item. Uh, very interested to your questions and, and feedback, uh, particularly as we head towards the 2019 budget project program. Uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Murphy now. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so basic overview of the bus stop improvement program. Uh, the purpose of this program is to improve safety, accessibility, and comfort to benefit the greatest number of riders. Uh, there's actually two categories for bus stop improvements. We have amenities, uh, comfort amenities, waiting amenities like shelters and benches. Uh, that's one category and the other one is accessibility. Uh, bus stop pads and concrete work that we do to make stops accessible. Uh, the bus stop's the gateway to our system. It's where most of our riders have their first impression of our services. We currently have 1,269 bus stops in the system. Uh, to give a ridership perspective on that or who's using these stops, 60% of our riders use just 100 of the bus stops. So 60% use 100 of the 1,269 bus stops. Um, over 500 of the stops have 10 riders or less. Sorry, is that per day or per trip? That is or? daily, yes, thank you, Eric. Average weekday. Uh, these are some of the guidelines that we use for uh, designing bus stops. Uh, the TCRP is the Transit Cooperative Research Program. Uh, that's a, a guideline that a lot of transit agencies use. Um, most of our peers use it. It's kind of the benchmark for designing bus stops. And on the right, we have pedestrian safety guide for transit agencies. It's a federal highway guideline. Uh, both of these guidelines include language from the American with Disabilities Act of 1990. Uh, two important bullets are bus stop boarding and alighting areas should be connected to streets, sidewalks, pedest pedestrian paths, and accessible route. So the bus stop pad has to connect to something, uh, a pedestrian network. Uh, the second one is the slope of the bus stop boarding area it needs to be at 2%. It's called the 2% uh, the rule. Um, it's kind of a challenge for uh, not just transit agencies, but street designers, uh, county and city struggle with this one as well. Uh, it's referencing the slope of the bus stop pad at 2%. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Uh, this is the current selection process that we use to determine where we're going to make these improvements. Uh, starting on the top there, uh, we do concrete bus stop, or bus stop pad improvements at lo boarding locations with 30 plus daily riders and alightings. So by that I mean we, we use a combination of boarding and alighting numbers for this improvement. So if there's 15 riders getting on or 15 getting off, we'll 
we'll do um, we'll consider that for that improvement so 30 plus daily boardings or alightings um, the bus stop pad on the right there shows the 2% I was showing you in the first slide um, that's what we mean when we reference a bus stop pad or sometimes a lead walk it's the connection between the existing sidewalk and the curb and that needs to be at 2% Um, the ride installs benches in all of their shelters. Uh, 40 plus daily boardings is the criteria we use for bench installations. And with adopt a stop, that allows us more um, opportunities. If a property owner wants to adopt, we can install benches with fewer riders than 40. Uh, 50 plus daily boardings for sh uh, shelter selection. This is a common industry service standard that's used in the industry uh, or benchmark 50 plus daily riders uh, shelters have benches trash receptacles and typically route information and map cases uh, this criteria is really important to maintain consistency so how would you get to this bus stop It's a trick question. Uh, it's interesting, though. It shows an example of a pad here that um, is not connected to a pedestrian network, right? So that either went in because there's a lack of communication. Uh, that happens. Or maybe somebody's doing, trying to do the right thing and put in a, what they thought, thought was what the transit agency needed. But that pad there needs to connect to a pedestrian network. Uh, if you'll notice that uh, this is not an AATA bus stop, by the way. Let's make, let's make that clear. Um, you'll notice that the bus stop pole itself has not been moved to that concrete pad. So unfortunately, if it's moved to the pad, they're claiming the pad, and the pad is not accessible. So unfortunately, uh, I think that's why the pole remains in the dirt there. Uh, the answer to the question is uh, it's a difficult one. If someone's using a mobility device, um, shopping cart, child stroller, they're going to have difficulty getting to this bus stop. In the wintertime, it's going to be even worse. So what's missing there is that infrastructure and that sidewalk. It kind of needs to happen in the reverse order we showed it. We need uh, pedestrian facilities first, and then we can connect public transit stops to it. So some of the challenges that we see uh, when doing these improvements, um, lack of infrastructure that we just saw in the previous slide, lack of footprint, uh, space in the right-of-way, lack of sidewalks, elevated sidewalks, which are shown to, on the picture to the left, easement, permission from property owners. Uh, we need permission from property owners anytime we locate a shelter or bench behind the sidewalk. Uh, design standards must be followed that we saw from the guidelines. And budget is certainly a challenge as well. Uh, in the picture there, you'll notice that, uh, again, this is the 2% they're talking about at the boarding area. This entire sidewalk had to be where this retaining wall is. The entire sidewalk had to be taken out, replaced to lower the transit stop, taper down at 2%. So these jobs get a little more expensive than just a basic uh, bus stop pad. Uh, this is kind of a, a breakdown of our accessibility system review of all the bus stops uh, starting with the yellow category there yellow piece of the pie 35 percent of the existing bus stops are in undeveloped or rural areas so there's no infrastructure there's no sidewalks sometimes no curb and gutter nothing there to attach the bus stop to uh, the green is uh, locations with sidewalks that don't attach to the, uh, don't have a, a bus stop pad. So 295 locations, 23% have sidewalks or infrastructure in place that gives us some opportunity to do something with. Uh, at the bottom is the 42% bus stops are accessible. By that we mean 
it attaches the sidewalk network to the curb where the uh, bus boards we consider those accessible bus stops 42 percent of those are accessible uh, in terms of ridership 84 percent of all of our riders use our boarding at bus stops in this blue area here 84 percent so that kind of shows a little progress there that we've made uh, the charts here show uh, progress in both categories um, accessibility improvements this is kind of a snapshot over the last 12 years um, and we're counting uh, bus stop how many stops got the improvement at this point so just so I know what what accounts for that rise in accessibility in the last 12 years I mean given that we don't control sidewalk sidewalks oh, etc so so this would be um, a combination of efforts with uh, the ride who with this program we make bus stops accessible mm -hmm. whenever we can and then we'll partner with city and county and MDOT with other projects to include public transit in a okay pedestrian did I answer your question Eric yep thank you sure uh, amenities uh, shows an increase as well with uh, trash receptacles benches and shelters over the last 12 years I think the uh, spike on the benches is due in part to the adopt a stop program so we're not just stuck on that 40 plus ridership standard and we'll put them in other locations just another question on this before you move on sure the the partnership with the municipalities or the jurisdiction that funding is typically shared their funding our funding state funding it's both actually uh, we, we do we do get, uh, occasionally get invoices and are billed for the work and other times if it's uh, depending on the size of the project if it's something that MDOT or the city can include at a relatively low cost uh, it's just included in the pedestrian improvements okay thank you Uh, the current ridership data indicates most of our stops have improvements that meet or exceed their usage currently so benches is a good example of that we have a lot more benches out there than the criteria suggests that we should uh, the adopt a stop program is also showing uh, some progress here uh, since 2008 big spike from 08 to 12 but uh, the purpose of this program is community involvement uh, property owners able to take ownership of the bus stop sharing that responsibility of maintaining it uh, cleaner safer bus stops and sure an offset with maintenance costs as well uh, this is a TCRP uh, report here that uh, did a case study on six six transit agencies in the United States with what they thought were success successful adopt to stop programs and we're one of the benchmarks in this uh, guideline state of good repair so uh, we added uh, in 2016 130 new bus stops as part of the service expansion uh, in 2010 between 2010 and 2017 we added 20 new shelter locations so to keep up with the demand and the increased ridership we've added um, full-time maintenance people that take care of bus stops full-time and there's an ongoing cost associated with that obviously So cycling back to the uh, pie chart here, the yellow undeveloped rural locations, 35% of our riders, whoop, 35% of our riders use these bus stops. Um, again, these stops lack infrastructure and sidewalks. There's no connectivity. It's real difficult to get pedestrian uh, bus stops, pedestrian connectivity. So for these we're usually looking for a collaboration are these a lot of these stops in some of the newer jurisdictions to the ride i.e. Ipsy Township and Ypsilanti some are yeah absolutely um, 
but we've also got a few on Washtenaw still, Eric, that don't have sidewalks, right? Mm -hmm. Right right in the, the heart of the uh, service area. A couple on Packard Road, mm -hmm. Ellsworth. So, um, again, uh, collaboration with the agency with jurisdiction over the street and sidewalk uh, is, is necessary in, in this situation. 8% uh, of our riders use bus stops in the yellow category. So opportunities moving forward, we'll continue to collaborate with our partners. Uh, transit does need to be at the table. We'll continue to do ongoing assessments to identify opportunities and monitor ridership for changing trends. Uh, this year, we already have planned uh, projects with MDOT, City of Ann Arbor, a couple of projects, Washtenaw County Road Commission coordinating bus stops, accessibility with uh, pedestrian networks and new crosswalks, and as well as uh, private developers, a couple of projects there too. This is a real good example of the, the need for that collaboration. This is a Washtenaw Avenue looking west at Glencoe Hills, kind of a before and after picture. Um, and be, before this sidewalk went in and the pedestrian network went in, there was very little opportunity for the transit agency to, to do much here. Uh, it met the criteria for a shelter for a long time, but without the infrastructure, it just wasn't possible to put it in. So back to the green section, this is uh, the locations that do have sidewalks. There's 23% of our bus stops that do have sidewalks or a pedestrian network that gives us opportunities to connect to. 40 of those bus stops with existing sidewalks have been identified for improvements as meeting the criteria of 30 plus daily riders, both boarding and alighting. 10 of those have elevated sidewalks and will be further assessed. Uh, they're gonna cost more money. Uh, they'll be much larger projects. We might need an engineer to draw these up, uh, but we'll have to assess them first and, and look. Uh, so this is the priority work plan and these 40 are what we'll target over the next two years. Uh, in summary, we'll review existing selection standards uh, criteria, uh, continue collaborating with partners. Uh, staff is also discussing uh, grant opportunities for funding, uh, maximize benefit for most riders with limited resources. So again, uh, purpose of this program is to improve safety, accessibility, comfort, to benefit the greatest number of riders. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions? Yeah, any, I'll open it up for questions. Why? I had a quick question. I, I think a slide or two ago, you mentioned the elevated. There's ten of ten of them have elevated sidewalks, and yeah. we'll probably have to bring in an engineer. Um, <laughs> I, again, I hate to keep bringing it up, but is that on our dime or is that on the jurisdiction's dime? Um, it is on our dime, Eric. But I think we've done that twice in the last ten years. Uh, these have to be really extremely elevated sidewalks, which a couple of these might be. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, when you say extremely, like more than 5% or is what's... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so Walmart, for instance, um, last uh, summer we did the job there. Uh, because the elevated sidewalk was, it was so severe, I think it was 12 15%. So um, to take that down, we needed a site plan. Um, the contractor basically wouldn't do it without that. Mm -hmm. right because of the uh, the utilities underneath so that gets expensive with uh you know by the time the shelter went in that location was twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars uh, a couple examples i showed you be two thousand dollars so and that's a line item that we look at every year bus stop improvement i can't rec i don't have the budget in front of me the last one but uh, yes, one thing that uh, I'm sure Jeff uh, could elaborate on. I th believe uh, the annual budget for funding the bus stops improvement about a hundred thousand a year. Hundred, yes, hundred thousand. 
and it's it, depending on his uh, work plan and the opportunities that come up because mm -hmm. he sort of mentioned sometimes uh, we'll work with the owners of the road or a private developer sometimes those are emergent and sudden so he may shift uh, priorities on the fly yep. um, but he manages to do several projects every year uh, the costs ebb and flow and the number of projects that can get done in a year kind of shift back and forth so when we when we light item that is that assuming we can't get any funding from anybody else like how, you know you have a work plan I'm gonna do X number of bus stops improvement this year I'm assuming I'm getting no help from anybody else to do this or is that in consideration based on maybe some historical data you know we split the cost 60 40 with somebody so we're gonna budget for the cost of that work plan 60 percent if you know if you follow me so just how does how do we arrive at that number based on your work plan in terms of the percentage that we budget for that's a good question um, I think the, uh, th there is there is talk with staff to do grants that are their shared cost grants or match grants um, but typically we're just operating on a hundred thousand dollar a year budget and getting as many of these projects we can with the city and the county and MDOT and we're at the table quite often um, nowadays um, so Jeff is it safe to say sort of traditionally we budget about a hundred thousand dollars and do as many projects at, per year as we can yes. with that money and when we're fortunate and we find uh, partnerships that allow us to defray our costs yep. we take them yeah, absolutely uh, and maybe the hundred grand goes a little bit further that year yes and it's also important to mention that the budget is for both of those categories concrete improvements shelters benches receptacles everything in the program goes under that budget so I know we've had some discussion <coughs> excuse me Eli in particular about increasing that amount you know hundred thousand um, to do more if we can, et cetera, which would you know be more personnel, more budget item, et cetera. Um, if if you had, and I'm just throwing, the, I'm lobbing this out there so you can get the board conversation going in terms of you know setting up next year's budget already. Um, you know, 1,269 stops. We've got you know, however many need improvement. If, if you want to go back a few slides to show us that that you want to target, I think it was 40 or whatever it was. Um, you know, we've got 436 that are not accessible right now. We've got, you know, 40 bus stops that are targeted. Um, of our 100,000, how much of those 40 could we do? Based on our 100,000, how, how many would we get through with our 100? Um, we could probably get through 20, 30 of those this year if we put our resources at that. Um, again, we need to do assessments to see how many of these are the, the real large jobs like, like the Walmart example I use, but a typical bus stop improvement is going to be two thousand yeah. dollars if you have a level sidewalk, right? And the, and the stars align. Mm -hmm. um, those are pretty affordable, but it's the it's the challenging ones that are, have all the elevation issues, uh, curb and gutter issues. Um, and we're not going to solve the issue tonight, but I guess we should have we probably should tee up a discussion. I guess you know. Since you you lobbed it out there, you the last time we had budget discussion about wanting more money for that, you know, based on what we've heard, we should probably think. You know, I I want you obviously to weigh in on what you think, and I'm sure you will. But I mean, if we weigh in on what you think we should be doing in terms of the bus stops, the targets, et cetera, um, and the the rest of the board to, hopefully, this will generate that those thoughts. But feel free to weigh in. Accept that as an invitation, and I'll start by apologizing. That's what it is. Apologizing in advance for any infelicities I might express, um, because one of the things that was thank you wherever you are, Jack. <laughs> what and and um, it, it relates directly to things that we would hear from that former board member. Uh, one of the I think it was the second slide. There was a page that made a reference at a footer about the American with Disability Act, and. We are providing public transit service to the public and the ADA requirements for accessible stops uh, doesn't begin or end at some arbitrary number of 30 plus or minus activities at a day. So if we have 1,200 locations where we have placed a sign and say we will pick you up here, we have an obligation to consider and perhaps even invest in assuring accessibility. Now we have the uh, A-Ride paratransit and that takes some of the burden of the law. But as uh, 
many of the folks who are within the disability community have told us over time is any improvement that you make that provides accessibility for those who have mobility challenges also facilitate easier transportation and mobility for all users and so by having a standard of 30 plus or minus recognizing that there's a history and a tradition of about a hundred thousand a year you're not going to want to go down to a lower number and hit a broader set of targets with your improvements because it becomes um, uh, you know, very vexing to outline something that you know is well beyond your means. And that was where, when we had our budget discussion and I saw a, a simple number, um, it raised the question. So, uh, fortuitous timing. Earlier today, the Federal Highway Administration facilitated a webinar and it was called uh, Safe Pedestrian Crossings at Transit Stops. And they had experts from other transit operators that were showcasing some of their programs. And I couldn't help but take a notice of, and I'm not comparing the Ann Arbor metropolitan area with Washington, D.C. Okay, so I just want to preface what I'm about to say. But WMATA had a representative, and for their bus program, this isn't about the metro subway, they had budgeted $100 million for accessibility to their bus system. And the representative, and that was system-wide, and they're like a seven-county area. Particularly, uh, one county was called out, and that's Montgomery County, Maryland, which is a urban county. Again, orders of magnitude well beyond Ann Arbor. But they have already invested $25 million in access to bus stops. So I applaud what we have done historically in providing what we can, but I look teeing it up for us as a board if other agencies are investing millions and are responding to the overarching law of the land in terms of the American with Disabilities Act uh, we have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves are we doing the right amount because as staff is saying and, and, and I'm not intending to be critical of staff because they are using the resources that we as a board make available to them uh, but the 100,000 includes not just the pad improvements. Uh, Jeff, what's a bus shelter cost to install, fabricate, deliver, install? So we could do, you know, four or five uh, shelters because there's concrete work and other work that goes along with that. And, or we could do, um, you know, uh, as staff said, 20 or 30 uh, pads where sidewalk exist but I don't know that we have a comprehensive strategic view uh, that you know staff has shown some operating policies but how do we as a board decide uh, when we talk about accessibility for all and we know that the ADA is out there and that uh, smooth hard surface and again I, I would tell you that although we get 80% favorable on our bus stops I suspect 99% of people prefer to get on the bus with dry shoes and not stand in a mud puddle and so if we don't have a hard surface and it rains or it snows we have challenges that our passengers need to overcome and so um, if I'm the only one who cares about this stuff then we can uh, continue to invest at a, a level but the interesting piece is that this webinar the federal government it was about crossings to transit. It wasn't about the expectation at the bus stop. Many of the presentations that I saw today included important elements like crosswalks. And we know as members of the AAATA board that our buses stop on both sides of the street. And if you get on on one side in the morning, you get off on the other side. And when you look at the condition of the stops and then you think about the roadway that exists between the stops and what interest do we have in collaborating with uh, our partner, uh, local governments, even MDOT on trunk lines. Um, it's been eight or nine years that we, the ride and the city of Ann Arbor have been 
haranguing the Michigan DOT to get a proper sidewalk at Pittsfield Boulevard and Washtenaw. Uh, and so that's an example where our riders, our passengers, our customers have to cross three streets to get from one bus to another at a bus transfer station. And these are the kinds of issues that we can talk about bus stops in the microscopic, do we have a hard surface connecting this pole in the ground to the curb, or we can begin to think about mobility as a individual experiences it and be a leader in framing what an appropriate investment, so this is board consideration, what's an appropriate level? What do we want our staff to frame for us to figure out how we fund and what choices we make as to what priority this gets versus other challenges uh, or requests to our budgeting process. So I'm not here to say, oh, we're here talking about bus stops, I'm gonna make an impassioned speech and we're gonna ramp this up uh, exponentially. I'd really like a, a thoughtful and deliberative approach of providing the accessibility that the community expects, that the law requires, and that we don't stop at where the hard surface hits the sidewalk, but we also consider, because Jeff knows in my day role with the city of Ann Arbor, that he and I over several years have worked uh, to adjust bus stop locations and crosswalks and crosswalk improvements, and we have our RFBs, rectangular flashing beacons that serve some of our higher uh, bus uh, stops. And so I think there's a wonderful working relationship, but that I believe that we as the transit authority have an obligation to do more than we're doing. And I suspect as we would look beyond the immediate city of Ann Arbor area and get out into the township and we get out into the city of Ipsy, the, the needs grow. Uh, and so those are system-wide numbers and I'm not wondering because I wouldn't call a bus stop in a lawn on Washtenaw uh, just to the east of Huron Parkway uh, a rural, it's a rural setting from a transportation engineer's description of it, but that's urban. And, it, and these stops are in urban areas. So I appreciate this being teed up. I don't have a number in mind, but I, I think that we have an obligation uh, to continue to provide the leadership and guidance for staff as to what it is that we want for folks to experience as they think about becoming a transit rider, as they approach the transit system, or as they exit our, uh, our, our buses, and do they have a comfortable, safe, and direct path across the street as well as on the bus. And so thank you for the opportunity. Again, I think staff's doing what we're directing them to do as a board with the resources that we've made available, but I think there's much more that we as an organization ought to be doing to respond to the high level policy description that we have about the service we provide. Thank you. Thank you, and I think it's, um, it's important that we as a board have this discussion because you raised this at the last budget cycle. Um, and I think, you know, the comments you just made get at the level of investment, and this is particularly um, timely now in that, you know, we, we, have a, we have an ENDS drafting committee where we are revising our ENDS to the extent we are going to do that. Um, we're seeking input, and this is important now. Matt is going to take whatever ENDS we vote on and give him and say, here's how I interpret that. Historically, here's how we've done, and this is the level of investment I'm going to put to this to meet the demands of what I think is a reasonable interpretation. But if we we can either influence that probably in two ways, we can either beef up whatever ends we have that would reach this goal um, of a transit experience, uh, or we can just flat out say, you know, we think the level of investment, here's how we, we can drill down and say the level of investment looks like this, and this is what we want to see. Matt's going to have to take that and say, all right, the board is requiring a higher level of investment from us um, and putting less emphasis on something else. As you've rightly pointed out, it's, there's going to be trade-offs depending on what we do. So Matt's going to have to work with that depending if we as a board decide that's a strong enough 
goal of ours and we want to put that forward, Matt's going to have to take that, interpret it, and put more resources into it than we as a board are going to have to live with that trade off. Uh, so I think this is a timely discussion and one, since we're kind of shifting from the ends to the budget process, uh, is, is to use your word fortuitous right now. So I'd like to, you know, it's unfortunate we, you know, we don't have more board members here this evening because this would be a great time to have this uh, and it would influence the ends committee quite, um, uh, quite appropriately. But I don't know if Matt, you want to add anything to it or? I, I appreciate the clarification from, from Eli because it does, it does sort of uh, get the, the thinking going um, uh, for whom and at what cost uh, in the policy governance parlance. Uh, and if we look at how we've been approaching this thus far, there's a utilization threshold. And that's basically to try to use the money cost effectively to benefit the largest number of people. It does not take into account whether or not those people are walking to the stop or rolling in there on a wheelchair. It just says 30, 30 plus or minus. Uh, so, uh, it's an effective way to manage it from a resource allocation perspective, but it doesn't entirely reflect some of the values I heard from Mr. Cooper just now about shouldn't we do more? And to over, to maybe take it to a logical conclusion, should every bus stop be wheelchair accessible? Um, even if we were to look at this green section, which I think is uh, an interesting example. So there are almost 300 bus stops in there that have a sidewalk. Jeff's criteria suggests that 40 of them have enough ridership to warrant it. If, and I'm looking at Forrest because he's going to be reviewing these, these standards, um, uh, do we lower the bar? We say about 20. What does that do? Or do we say, you know what, 100%, all of them. Uh, we can do that. Those are, it's, our, it's our standards, our rules, uh, based on the values the board uh, gives to us. But Ms. Cooper is also right that that comes at a cost at about $100,000 a year and doing 15 or 20 a year, it'll take two and a half years to get through the 40 that are here. Assuming ridership doesn't continue to grow and that list just gets longer and longer as more bus stops are added, um, uh, we can double it and be done in a year, assuming I have staff capacity uh, to actually handle that level of work. Um, uh, or do we, or do we want to say, you know, hey, we want everything a tent near a sidewalk to be wheelchair accessible, even if it's hardly ever used by anyone in a wheelchair or otherwise. Certainly, that's something that we could target as a an outcome uh, uh, based on the level of value the board suggests. But it will come at a cost. It will take more time, and that cost presumably means something else isn't happening. Uh, and so the trade-off, uh, the trade-off continues. So this this standard is a good standard, but it is sort of a blunt instrument intended to deal with strictly the volume of passengers, not the specifics of their needs. And so there's there's opportunity here. I'm just curious. I mean, I, maybe it's also partially an owner, an owner, uh, an owner question as well. I mean, we've got we've got you know Jeff gave us some numbers, right? Seven thousand four the stop, 2000 typically for the grading and, and some other things. So we could probably do some very quick, dirty math in terms of, hey, here's, here's what we'd like to see. We know it'll cost maybe X and, you know, Matt, Jeff, Forrest, they can probably verify the numbers for us. But, um, I mean, we could even drill down to here's what we'd like to accomplish in the next budget cycle and put that resources to it. I mean, that would be very easy for Matt to follow in that case, like, you know, you know, script it out for him and say we'd like this, you know, many um, pads built, we'd like this many bus stops built at a cost of 7000 per or 2000 et cetera, and we could build out from there. Uh, it's just a matter of, again, trading the money off and deciding we want to do that. So, I mean, but that's, we should have more dialogue about that because that's, that we get into some interesting discussions there. Roger? Glad both of you mentioned that, you know, there is a, a trade-off. Pardon me. <laughs> There's a trade-off. Um, you know, if we spend money here, what doesn't get done, or what what do we sacrifice? And I think you know, the board has to set that higher level. Where 
what are our priorities and Matt has to respond to those so I'm glad you're both you know we're both aware of um, there's whatever we do whether we're talking about bus stops or anything else we do there's always got to be a consideration of okay if we do this what doesn't get done and which is mo most important and that's you know there are no simple answers to that and the second I guess is sort of a little cautionary uh, uh, that uh, somebody who's been around a long time <laughs> has a little perspective on um, our transit authority and probably every transit authority has bus stops where our customers have to be at a particular location at a particular time we're now seeing the advent of uber and lyft where they will get to a location you want at a time you want to, them to be there and yes it's not affordable for for most people and um, it's, a, it's really in its infancy but I'll, I'll give you a little anecdote um, back in a uh, in the distant past in a, a different lifetime for me I was doing uh, retail lease leasing finding uh, retail tenants for uh, shopping center spaces retail space I was at a conference that uh, this expert was giving a presentation to I don't remember anything about the presentation except at the very end uh, somebody asked a question so do you think this online ordering is going to have any impact on retail and uh, the answer was you know I never thought it'd be more than three percent of retail and you know now it's six so you know it might um, and you know if we say okay this is how we operate our system and this is so we're gonna have a great bus stop program but in 10 or 20 years are bus stops obsolete I don't know but it's something you know I think as a board we've got to be able to to have some idea of looking forward of okay what will the future look like and make some decisions instead of just saying let's do what we do now only better because what we do now might be obsolete in the future thank you yeah I mean those trade-offs to your I mean your scenario that you just to, if you want to play that out you know we've got 12 you know, almost 1300 bus stops now let's say in the next 10 years we want to increase that to 2300 bus stops to make it more competitive with the you know ubers and lifts who drop you off and pick you up where you want when you want we want to go to 2300 but that might mean they're not going to all be pristine right um, so we won't have the money to do both or do we just make the ones we do have good enough and attractive enough that people will forego those other services to take the ride I, I don't know I mean that's that's a trade-off we as the board have to wrestle with if I might just a little bit of back of the envelope context just for the screen section at 15 bus stops a year let's say roughly the same level of investment we have it would take about 20 years to do all 300 of those bus stops just to put that in context double the budget have the time roughly but the values question underneath it I think is important for the board to, to grapple with and it's not something staff could uh, uh, suppose um, what value is placed on uh, accessibility certainly uh, the bus pads are useful to any pedestrian who uses them and would certainly be appreciated by any able-bodied customer using them as well but the pad but they can also use the bus stop already the pads are really there for uh, wheelchair accessibility primarily they benefit anyone with the mobility limitation uh, walkers as well um, but it's primarily for that function um, is there is there an interest in having everything that could be accessible let's say that's just the blue and the green section because the yellow section no sidewalks kind of hard to even touch that one yet is the value of the board based on what your you know uh, feeling of the ownership's values that we should be a fully accessible bus stop system and then it's just a question of how fast can we get that done and at what level of investment this system right now is not set up for what Mr. Cooper articulated. This system uh, gets to a point where we've done all 40, and if ridership isn't growing, it stops. Eventually you're done. If our ridership never grew, we'd do these 40, we'd be done. The other 230, 40 uh, some odd bus stops would be finished. It would never be touched, I suppose. 
So that's a just to try to help you grapple with the values related uh, uh, to that. And uh, I think Mr. Yang also has uh, something he could offer. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind using the mic, that's good. Thanks. Well, thanks. I just want to share a few facts or some, you know, ongoing the planning process. Um, as Jeff mentioned, there are the, in the blue pie, like those are fully accessible bus stops, 84% ridership. So this is only represent 8%. Um, when we look at a whole 12, 69 bus stops, the 500 bus stops, top 500 you know, popular bus stops, carry about 90% ridership. Um, so there, you can, we can find a way to prioritize, and this is kind of a one way to do it. Um, the other thing, you know, we do have a sort of a procedure or pro process to handle wheelchair. You know, we're going to park, uh, the bus is going to stop, uh, load the customer at the driveway at the, some location, I mean, safer. Um, even in the winter time, you know, when bus stop, there are snow uh, related issues, and there are Typically, the operators would do that. Uh, customers can wait at the nearest driveway. Um, the other thing, I appreciate uh, the on-demand concept. Going forward, really, I mean, this is an interesting time for transit, for traditional fixed route bus system. Uh, our, no question, our core business will continue to be a big bus, but there will be other alternatives available. So this is gonna be a part of probably our conversation with the ridership coverage or going forward for the long range plan. So where we are going from here? Are we gonna continue operate fixed route buses everywhere? Doesn't matter how, pe how people are using that? We don't know yet. We're gonna go through the process with the community, with the board. Uh, for next year, the plan is to develop a long range plan. And through that process, we're gonna identify the best way to deliver services, public transportation service. May not be always fixed route, and big buses. So that something to keep in mind, you know, the, the on-demand service is on the table, it's, some, it's a concept. I mean, other system already try to use, you know, have a contract with Uber, Lyft, or something similar in in-house operations. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, in terms of the guideline, um, you know, this is uh, the guideline we use now, but we're in the process of gonna review those guidelines and not just bus stop guidelines, the whole service design guidelines. So as a part of the long range planning process, we're gonna go back and look at, you know, what, it, what is the right guideline or service design standards for this community? Or it depends on different services we design. Uh, for certain, maybe, you know, those corridor services, we have different guidelines, service design standard. And maybe for some low, lower density uh, neighborhood, we can have different type service standard. So that's something I just wanna mention and help you to think through the process. Thank you. That's helpful, thank you. Comments or other discussion on what we've seen or talked about? Pyra? Uh, Jeff, I think you mentioned that 84% of riders are boarding at an accessible bus stop. Is it pos possible to know what percentage of our customers who do have mobility issues are boarding at the accessible bus stop? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we do have some ride check data uh, ridership uh, that does show wheelchair deployments. So um, I think the data that we looked at uh, recently showed 10 people uh, using wheelchairs at stops that were not accessible. So there was only 10, but those 10 do make for a good target for an improvement, regardless of ridership, right? Because um, you know who your audience is and exactly who you're serving. So that's a good question. If I might follow up, question to my own staff. Um, if we become aware of a bus stop 
where there is a, a documented need for a wheelchair or other mobility special, do we take that into consideration uh, in terms of providing the asphalt, uh, the concrete, and making it accessible, or does it still have to meet the number of boardings necessary? I mean, would we ever put in a concrete pad where there's just one person using it, but that person's in a wheelchair? Do, do we do that? Or We've that never done that, Matt, but um, we have coordinated with the city. Uh, Center of Independent Living on more than one occasion has requested that we have chair users, and they know where the, who's, who's using stops where. So based on that information, we've partnered with the city uh, to I do see. a couple of stops like that. So we typically wouldn't do it for one rider calling, but I can't remember the last time it's happened. It's usually a group effort Yeah, and one the of city the or the county. <coughs> one of the challenges just so we, 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 we so we will sometimes get a request for an individual for consideration of an individual it's usually a very sympathetic situation um, but individuals come and go and, and sometimes they move and so uh, we've seen situations where um, we recently expanded paratransit services maybe last year to a postal partner uh, outside of the city of Ann Arbor because of one resident very vocally asking their board of trustees for the whole paratransit service and we expanded it and two weeks later she moved to Florida so uh, same thing happens unfortunately when you're dealing with just individuals those things those things come and go but I'm, I'm glad to hear that we can be responsive to a degree uh, when there is a special request So some good discussion and good ideas, and I think there's some follow-up discussion in, um, that needs to be had and probably some philosophical debates this board needs to have, hopefully when we have a fuller board, uh, more people, and flu season has passed, hopefully we'll, we'll do that. Any other questions, discussion on this? Thank you, Jeff. It's very helpful and informative, and, and Forrest, thank you, and Matt, thank you. Uh, more to come on that. Uh, any other announcements or emerging business that we need to know from any board members, anybody present or Matt, that we haven't discussed yet? Ms. Sims? Kind of funny at this board meeting, but I will not be at the next board meeting. Just FYI, I'm yeah. on vacation. Actually, I have a conflict the next board meeting, too. So. Um, Actually, without the lawyers present, you might get something done, right? <laughs> Anything else? Uh, we do have some members of the public, so why don't we open it up for public comment time. You can use the microphone. You have three minutes to address, uh, address the board on uh, any issue that you want us to be informed about. So feel free and please uh, state your name for the record. Hi, I'm Dr. Lori Lichman. I'm a clinical psychologist in, Ar in Ann Arbor, and um, I'm also a co-leader for Michigan Abolitionist Project, MAP, and the, we're a bunch of community groups that are trying to help uh, raise awareness and end human trafficking. Um, so I'm here today to request that um, uh, that uh, the bu bus terminals and bus stops put um, these human trafficking hotline numbers on um, to make aware for um, the community. Like there's children, uh, actually the common age of human trafficking entry is age 12 to 14. These kids are also um, uh, runaways uh, we know are being <coughs> approached by traffickers within uh, 48 hours. Um, the human trafficking hotline number has reported, this is in, um, in DC, that um, in Michigan t in 2017, that 305 uh, human trafficking cases were reported for Michigan alone. So I'm really, um, it's a public health crisis. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping that the, uh, uh, and I, here's the information. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we all agree that is a public health crisis, yes. and we appreciate your uh, Oh, your just one more thing. Um, MDOT um, approved that um, we put these in the rest areas, and volunteers have been um, 
managing the stickers at the re at rest areas because truckers transport tr um, tr uh, victims. But now MDOT is actually taking on uh, the whole state of Michigan, and they're going to be in all the rest areas. So, um, and um, the state of Ohio is also adopting the stickers. So uh, I'm just hoping that our bus stops can do that too. Yeah, Thank you for your time. Okay. Anybody else from the public? So I'm strictly speaking as a member of the public. I want to thank Mr. Cooper for the dialogue that he started about the ADA and the bus stops. Um, I don't know, I'm kind of old, so I remember when there was no such thing as curb cuts. And curb cuts started coming in slowly, and it not only benefited persons who use mobility aids, but m women who use perambulators or, you know, uh, with their children or when I was a child as a bike rider my mom didn't have to worry about me trying to you know jump over the curb and jump back up the curb on my bike so I want you to think th about how your bus stops not only will help uh, and help the ADA and persons like myself who use a wheelchair to ambulate but will, by making the bus stops um, more attractive in terms of having a pad I think you'll find that others will follow um, and I want AATA to keep in mind that, to me, I've watched the growth of the amount of stops that are accessible, and I want to thank you for that because it has improved my life dramatically because I am able to go more places. There are still some areas that need improvement, but I am very encouraged by what I heard tonight. I also want you to recognize the unsung heroes of your organization which are the drivers um, in the winter there's the effort of when you have snow or ice you know tell the driver that you want to uh, go somewhere else but my chair alone is 295 pounds without me in it and there are many stops where the drop the, the bus drops the ramp and I have to cross the grassy area to get to the sidewalk if I stop I'm stuck so I take a running start <laughs> off the end of the ramp and I to get to the sidewalk, otherwise I'm mired in muck. Um, many bus drivers are very open to, I will say, you know what, that stop is not accessible to me. I know it's just m mud and rain, but could you please put me in the next driveway, the next uh, you know, safe area? Many of them will comply. The harder part is educating drivers on the pickup end of it because there are many stops that are not accessible. You, I may be waiting in an area that isn't a typical stop. And so there have been times where I've been sitting there and I'm like, come get me and I don't wave because I know you're not supposed to do that. But it's like I'm here and they keep going because I'm not in a traditional stop. It's not snow and ice, but I can't get to the bus from uh, an example would be on Main Street at Packard. There is a stop um, on the west side of the street that the sidewalk and the grassy area there's like a three or four inch dip between the two and then it's actually not a grassy area anymore it is now nothing but dirt and stone so I have to wait in another area it's not typical for them to see someone in that spot so I want to thank the drivers who do see me but I think it's important to let the drivers know that there are going to be other things besides snow and ice hampering people who use wheelchairs or other mobility aids from using a stop and may be in an atypical area. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello. Michelle Barney Ypsilanti. The thing I came to say really was we have the new ride books for the new change of schedule. They are the best I've ever seen. I really wanted to compliment you guys. The print, the color of the pages is brighter for some reason. It's not a color, it's the same beige, but it's brighter and much easier to read. And my fellow residents in Chichester Place appreciate it. You also have much more information about planning in advance that's very, very helpful. I want to respond to this uh, discussion. First of all, while wheelchairs are the most obviously essential people who need the improvements, please, in your thinking, include 
people who use walkers like I do and canes. There are many of us, even in good weather, where grass is a very difficult problem. There are many stops along Packard. There are stops along the number four route on Washtenaw. There are stops along the number six route um, along Ellsworth, where I get off on grass and pushing the walker is a real problem. On, on the bus at Liberty Road, as you get out of downtown, I have to ask the drivers to drop me at the um, driveway going into a mall, a strip mall, because I've tried getting across the grass. And it's not only difficult, but if the wheels of the walker get hung up, they end up tipping me over. That's a, it's not just wheelchairs. There are lots of people who need that done. Um, there is a problem at Ypsilanti Transit Center in the winter. The two slopes at the ends of the blocks are not reliably kept salted and free of ice and snow. And that's at the transit center. When I go inside and I ask, the security guards are not AAATA employees. They're outsourced and they have no idea why it isn't done. Usually the, the, the pavement by the buses is okay, but the walkways that, that you roll a walker or a wheelchair up are not always clear after a snow has stopped. And that really, I'd like to see you pay some attention. The other thing is probably not your business, but I wonder if you could affect it. There are places, the Walmart stop on Ellsworth is one of them. There is, there, the sidewalks have, have been improved, but there is no sidewalk when you get off the bus and you get to the sidewalk and you're walking or wheeling or whatever to the mall. There is no sidewalk along that path. You have to wheel out into the traffic, against the traffic. The, another one is Glencoe. Both the Glencoe Mall and the Glencoe Hills housing. They're very wealthy places. Do they have any responsibility to make their areas, now it's not the bus, but from the bus into the mall space? If by talking with them, the bus people could move them along or talk to the city, maybe something could be done to help all those areas. Um, I really appreciate that you are taking an interest in doing all these things. The other problem, which is not this, but which I wanted to mention, there is a problem with security and has been for a long time at the Ypsilanti Transit Center. Security presence and the building being open ends 15 minutes to half an hour before the last buses pull in and we connect with our bus to our place. Like the last six from downtown and the 45 goes out to Chidester. The security people are gone, and the, and the Ypsilanti Transit Center is closed, and we're chased out. Now, in summer, at least it's getting light, and it's getting warmer. In winter, it's dreadful. It may be snowing, it may be cold, it may be dark, and we have to stand out there for 15 minutes until our bus comes. That's a mistake. That's a safety mistake both in terms of falls and ice and in terms of security and getting jumped. I hope somebody will look into that. I've asked that before, and it, it, it hasn't changed, but it's very important. So thank you for all the things you're doing. I would like to know, I want to talk to someone about the millage. I've read everything in the papers, and, and you have here the millage ballot thing. It's time to start politicking. Who here, who is the person that I would talk to about discussing what I'm doing and coordinating efforts in IPSI? I hope you will tell us something about that. Sure, I mean, we uh, will, um, I'll have Matt reach out to you. It's, but we are kind of running it through a ballot committee uh, that we have. The Partners for Transit is also reactivated and working again. Um, so we've got a ballot committee, we've got a treasurer, we've got uh, messaging that we're doing, so we're working with Partners for Transit again. Um, and we'll be happy to have Partners for Transit or one of the people reach out to you and coordinate with them. Yeah, I hope that you're getting on it, like you say. 
because everybody from any party or, or concern that has assumed for the last two years that, oh, we got it before, we'll do it again, has lost. I mean, it's just been a tremendous, we've seen it with political elections, Republicans, Democrats, whoever, they assume, and then they don't put out the effort. Yeah. And I'm afraid that the same thing will happen with the millage, because people are still opposing what they see as higher taxes. We, we will do everything we can to make sure that does not Thank happen. You. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I guess then we'll call this non-meeting meeting to an end. And thank you for your time and participation. We'll see you next month, or some of us will see you next month.